This is The Thing About Cars, a podcast for car enthusiasts and the people who love them. Hello again, this is The Thing About Cars, and we're sitting here in Strong Box West with our friends... Becca. Ben. Misty. And I'm Mickey. Uh, you need to check out this space. Strong Box West is a, is a really cool facility, and they're letting us record here. Um, their website is www.strongboxwest.com. Robert's question was, where is the line between when you should consider a hybrid and when you drive so much that having one makes little sense? That's a very interesting question, and I wish he was here to give us a little more about it, because I'm not sure that he's got it in the right direction. Exactly. I was thinking it's, you know, there's no such thing as driving too much that, that makes a hybrid not work. Right. Well, it depends on how, how any given hybrid works, too, though. Some have an electric mode and some don't. Right. Uh, in the case of my brother's car, he has a Toyota Prius. It's uh, just a handful of years old. It's the just now previous generation. And I know it has an, an all electric mode. It's got, you know, another mode where it'll do electric up to a certain speed, then the gas will take over. Uh, but then there are some hybrids that, uh, that don't do that. There are some that use the gas and the electric either all the time or they just turn on the electric now and then to supplement the electric. For instance, Lexus uses hybrid technology not for MPG, but for acceleration performance. Right. They add that full torque of the electric motor just to get the car off the line a little faster. Yep. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real variable question. It depends on what your goals are. Um, if you're doing a whole lot of driving, then, yeah, with most MPG-oriented hybrids, you probably will be on the gasoline engine most of the time. Right. In fact, I think, to Robert's point, if you are doing a lot of Robert style driving long distance stuff, mm -hmm. it makes sense to have a hybrid and not a full gas car. It could, yes. Yeah. And if you have a plug-in, you get even more range out of your batteries. So uh, yeah, depending on exactly what kind of, you know, whether it's a whole lot of city or some highway or, you know, there are different trade-offs. There's trade-offs with everything. Yeah. My question with that would be though, the charging. You can only go X right. amount of miles on a charge and then the length of time that when you have to stop and charge that battery, the length of time that you are not on the road going to where you need to be, um, you know, how does that even out? Does it? Well, with the mm -hmm. hybrid, since you have the gasoline engine, you're never completely at the mercy of charging. Um, you know, you've always got the gasoline to go on if you have to go. Right, it'll switch over to gas and but you can charge your battery by default. How much? Gas is the question because, like I'm saying, if you're like me, I have family up right. Michigan. Mm -hmm. Let's say something's going on. It's happened before. Some family emergency has happened. You now need to do this 12-hour trip. Your battery is going to get you, what, 250 on some of them? Um, but you've got an 800-mile drive to go. Some of the batteries I've heard, they can take, what, 45 minutes to an hour sometimes? To charge, I think it depends on the vehicle. I don't have a ton of experience. I just right. listen to my friends who have something complain about it. Right. Well, it depends too on which type of charging you do. For instance, if you're running, you know, 110 straight to the car, that's going to take all day to charge. You know, no ifs, ands, or buts. But if you have the, oh, what do they call the? I, I talked to the owner of a of, a, uh, of an all electric smart this morning. It's a phase two charge or something like that. I it's the high. Right. Yeah, it's the high voltage one that you have to have specially wired in your house. That'll charge it in about an hour. Right. Well, I think it still just comes down to a question of basic range. And what yeah. you do then is you calculate the range of the battery plus the range of the gas. Right. The thing, though, to remember is now you're looking at cost and not just range. So that hybrid may still go 500 miles between fill-ups or recharges. Oh, yes. But it'll cost you a fraction of what you could do in the same with the same fully gas-powered vehicle. Another advantage, too, if you're, uh, say, say it's the end of the day, you have to get out of a big city to go somewhere, you're stuck in that city traffic as you're working your way out. And I've been in this situation a lot of times trying to get out of Atlanta to go to Alabama to visit family. You know, I'll spend an hour plus creeping through that Atlanta freeway scene trying to get out of here. And if you're just creeping along, that's a great time for that electric motor. Those little small movements, those low speed movements. So that puts your first fuel stop on the highway that much further down the road. 
Plus, if you're in dense traffic, you're not making noxious tailpipe emissions. Right. Now, I had had a, a friend, I, I won't say the name of car, she had an electric car, and she had actually said that the slow-moving traffic ate into her battery time, that she did better with her battery time when she was moving at a rate of speed, a consistent rate of speed, um, as opposed to the stop and go. That's possible. Uh, you know, just differences with different hybrid designs. You know, no two hybrids really use the same setup. Uh, the Prius, for instance, you've got the electric motor, you've got the gasoline engine. They both have inputs into the transmission. Whereas the Chevy Volt, uh, there's no mechanical connection from the gasoline engine to the wheels. It drives a generator. So you're always running off either the generator's output or the battery. I'm curious about the Volt. I still want to drive. Yeah, I test drove the previous generation a couple of years ago, and uh, it was really fascinating. It was outside my budget for a car at the time, but I was curious enough that I went and drove it anyway. Right. So let's make sure we're answering Robert's question. Right. He says, <laughs> he says where is the line between when there you should consider a hybrid and when you drive so much that this makes little sense? So, so the question itself is sort of flawed. Yeah. But, uh, well, if you're already considering it, you, you right. already see a possibility to either save money, save gas, or something in there. You, you see that it could potentially help you. If you're already considering it, that's yeah. when you just need to go ahead and right. weigh the pros and cons. What is it going to cost me? Am I going to keep the other one? Um, just and I think it comes down to that. I think it comes down to that calculation of is, is the savings I'm going to have from this hybrid outweighing the savings that I would have from either repairing my old car or getting a full gas car. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing he needs to do to figure out where that line is, is probably get on an enthusiast forum, whether he's looking at a Prius, a Volt, or whichever hybrid, find a user group of that car and compare experiences with people. Definitely. What's going to happen to the Volt, I'm wondering? Um, isn't the Volt made by Holden, like some of the other GM vehicles? That's a good question. I don't know. They're shutting down Holden, last I heard. Huh. 2017. We'll have to look that up. Check yeah. that out. Well, they might just be displacing it to yeah. some other country, but it, it was popping into my head. For listeners who don't know, Holden is the Australian division of General Motors. And there's a little bit of interplay. Uh, you know, for, there, there are some GM models in the United States that have been based on Holden's. Yeah, not a great deal. They're, they're doing it more. Holden was an acquisition done a long time ago that, uh, that makes a lot of the V8 cars down in Australia, but uh, last I heard GM was, was looking at sacking them. Hmm. But they've just recently started tapping them, so I, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't know either. Maybe one of our listeners can contact us on our Facebook page and let us know. And there's a, a hilarious, definitely NSFW <laughs> YouTube clip. It's a, it's a satire of a, of a car ad. It's a, it's a Holden version of a Chevy pickup. And the ad announcer guy is shocked that a woman is driving it and using it on her farm and all this. And there's a lot of cursing in it, but it's kind of funny. Is NSFW a kind of car? <laughs> it, it should be no, NSF PC, no. I guess. And it's not Something. safe for podcast. Not safe for young ears, whatever. <laughs> I always say it's never safe for uptight people because yeah, yeah, there's cursing in it. Yeah. Right. I've been in work environments where we're like. You know, it was mm -hmm. rated R during the interview, but uh, yeah. But were they cursing about their cars? No, they were not cursing <laughs> about their cars. So, Robert, if you're hearing this podcast, please hit us on our Facebook page. That's the thing about cars uh, on Facebook, and uh, let us know if we addressed your question or not, or if you have any opinions on the matter of hybrid versus full gas. Uh, we'd love to hear from you in general. Um, but I had another question. I, I wrote down this thing earlier. I simply wrote down the Mustang room. <laughs> what is the Mustang room? <laughs> um, the Mustang room is one of my pet projects. Um, I have forever had a love of Mustang, and not, not truly forever. When I started out as a kid, um, I followed, of course, my father's passions, which lied more or lay more in the area of uh, Chevy, GM, that kind of thing. Um, so anyhow, very long story short, um, since I was 16, I've had a Mustang in, in one way or another. And many years ago, because I make it kind of common knowledge, I'll have Mustang pictures or whatever. 
someone walked up to me at work and handed me a matchbox car that they had. Somebody had given it to them. It was a 1964 and a half red convertible matchbox. And she tells me, I think you could use this better than I could. And it started something. It became, I wonder what other matchboxes, models, what can I get my hands on? And the collection <laughs> grew. Um, so much so that the room, there, there is an entire room dedicated to Mustang. Um, almost everything in there, except for maybe some of the furniture or something, has something to do with Mustang. This is a room in your house, right? This room is in my house. And I had actually had to give up the original Mustang room uh, when I had, when my boys were born. Um, but we moved to a new house where there was some extra space and the Mustang room came back and it's only going crazy now. Um, the Mustang now has its own Facebook page, Instagram page, <laughs> and it hasn't done a lot now. There's a reason for it, but the Mustang room now has a blog to show you how to recreate some of the things that I have done. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's basically a temple, a shrine to show my devotion to this vehicle, to uh, everything from matchboxes to lighters. I have a, I'm not kidding, there is a Mustang G-string hiding in the room. <laughs> oh boy. Um, that, was, that was courtesy of my sister-in-law. Sure. I have my Mustang belt buckle on now. Um, cool. Lots of stuff out there. And for those of you who can see it, it's an actual <laughs> Mustang seat belt buckle. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's it's the place to go because I, I know sometimes my my love for this can be strange, what have you. Insert insert description here. So I never wanted it to spread throughout my house. I didn't want it to be you walk in and you're inundated to buy a Mustang in this one house. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have rooms where everybody was comfortable and it was just you know just a living room. So this, this was where everything went to lived, where I could, I could go to my shrine and be surrounded by what makes me happy. <laughs> so if, <laughs> if anyone wanted to buy you a gift for your Mustang room, what would be a nice thing to get? I, I actually made a meme, one of the earlier memes when the Mustang room first came out on <laughs> Facebook. Uh, one of the earlier memes was a picture from one corner that had been done that was packed, just barely see the wall of, of Mustang stuff and I put on it you don't know what to buy me surely you know how to Google Mustang stuff <laughs> <laughs> so yes if you're ever at a loss of what to get me Mustang did I ever tell you I was running a car and I saw a Mustang ceramic uh, vase uh, flower vase or something like no. that and I'm like how much do you want for that and the guy behind the counter wouldn't sell it to me uh. I'm like I'll give you 30 bucks for it right now cash he's <laughs> like no it's not really mine to sell and he says but it, we got it from one of those edible arrangement kinds of deals and apparently they delivered in a in a I mean it wasn't officially licensed but it was clearly a Mustang profile wow. and I may go back there and try to acquire it wow um, if he'll let me steal it yeah I'm the silly kind of person there's a yeah. um, Box. It was meant to be one of those. I don't know. I don't know if it was meant to be collector's items because yeah. uh, I'm the kind. I'll walk into your local art parts store, and if the car wash has a picture of a Mustang on the front, I want that car wash. Right. Um, so Turtle Wax, I think it was many years ago, had some kind of kit for a limited time, and you know, it, it's got the wash and the wax and the the sponge in it. And on the outside, it's this metal tin that it's coming in. You know, that's why they can charge you a fortune for this. Yeah. And it's got a Mustang on it. So what do I do? I have the tin. Because it's just <laughs> randomly anything that shows up with Mustang. Sure. I'm trying to be good right now. I'm, I'm trying very hard to, to not spend too much on that right now. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, everything and anything Mustang. Cool. And folks can find you on Facebook and on Instagram, like you said. At the Mustang Room. Very cool. All right. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to read another question, and I just want to put this out there in general right now so our listeners can be in on this conversation. We, we are reading questions that we get via our Facebook page for now. Um, we are playing with the notion of what it means to actually get live participation, you know, via Skype or a phone line or something. Um, uh, the, the question is currently how do we get a studio monitor set up so that we can hear the questions as they come in on Skype because frankly using Skype is easy right getting the sound out of a Skype device into the soundboard is easy but then how do we hear the questions that those people are asking uh, 
that's a little more difficult with the with the microphone setup that we've got. So we are working on these things. We would like to see this happen. We just don't know how to do it with the current you know mic setup that we're using. And Misty and I talked about it briefly on the way in today. It's not impossible to do. You would just need an extra mic to kind of pick up there. Yeah. Feed it into here. Yeah. Or I was even wondering since you can Skype on devices like iPads, yep. is there a way to connect, say, maybe the headphone yep. outlet That's to exactly either the right. soundboard or another device? But then how do we hear what they're saying? So we're using condenser a mics. A speaker device that, like right. she's saying, can be picked up by a microphone? And since we're using condensers, we would have to either put a speaker on the table with them on it, or we would feed them directly into the soundboard, and then all of us are now wearing headphones so that we can hear them that doesn't interfere with this setup. So anyway, let's get on with this question. We can always tackle this later. Yeah. Uh, the question is from J. Matthew O'Keefe via Facebook. He says, if your car is paid off but has terrible gas mileage, does it make sense to lease a new car with better gas mileage? He says, I guess this is a car math question. Do you save having no car payment or does leasing an efficient car have bigger savings? And um, he realizes there are other factors that probably affect the answer, but I figure that's enough right. for us to talk about for a while. Well, I think um, it depends. Uh, he left out. It, why is he leasing the new vehicle? Right. Is he keeping the old vehicle? Right. Um, or is it simply a financial standpoint and leasing is a better option over buying? I, I think there's a lot of open yep. open questions there to, to actually answer. It. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that you know the, it, it's half a question of lifestyle too, because if your lifestyle is uh, uh, is all is, is sort of centered around a, 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 a purchased car instead of a leased car, that might actually change the answer a little bit. Um, I would like to interject and just say it all depends on his budget. Mm -hmm. Depends on what car payment that he would have versus the gas that he yeah. pays um, over time. You know, if you're leasing a car, you have to pay on it for months at a time. Plus, you know, your insurance goes up because of the car model. Exactly. There's a lot of things to, to factor in there. Exactly. Um, and every time I've done the calculation for my own cars, it always comes out cheaper to keep the old car. Because once you factor in, you know, insurance, um, depreciation, a car payment, it's always cheaper just to keep the old car, even if it's a gas guzzler. Now, sometimes, and I'm kind of kind of going to kind of go two directions here. Yeah. Um, sometimes newer vehicles are actually coming with maintenance plans, yeah. depending on the car company. Oh, yes. So a lot of time within your first X mileage, depending on how many miles you're driving, they're going to pay for your oil changes and things like that. It, it really depends on the company, how much you drive. Um, but also with older vehicles, if it being a gas guzzler is really the only problem with it, if mechanically the car is okay, but you don't like the fuel consumption, depending on how bad that consumption is, there are modifications you can make to that vehicle to make it more, more efficient. It's not going to come out like the hybrids or electrical or, or a practical car, but there are still ways that, that you can tame some of the car's consumption. Mm -hmm. So it, it really depends on, is the decision based on finances? Do you still love that car? Um, you know, are you looking for a reason to get rid of it, but you can't justify a car payment? It, it really depends. Right. Yeah, and paid for is a powerful motivator. Uh, that's a phrase that's been used so often in life. You know, paid for, paid for. I saw a uh, years ago driving, not that many years ago, probably about 2003, I was driving around Dallas, Texas with my brother one day, and we slowly passed this probably about 1970 or 71 Dodge that had a, a little homemade sign in one of the side windows that said, no power steering, no power brakes, no payments since the, the Nixon administration. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> exactly. So I'm not sure we answered his question, but uh, if we did or if we didn't, O'Keefe, please drop us a line and let us know on our Facebook page, the thing about cars on Facebook. Um, and I hope we didn't answer his question, I mean, I guess it's different. Some people think of leasing as the thing to do, and some people think of buying as the thing to do. Well, there is so. more than just one leasing option, too. Yeah. If it's if you want to own this vehicle, if you want it around longer than a leasing term, um, but your finances can't allow you to purchase the vehicle over, fi or, uh, over leasing, um, I believe it's called the close-ended lease, where you have the option to purchase the vehicle at the end of that contract. 
where some of the leases you you don't you right. you cannot have that car at the end of the lease. There are some where right. you can buy it out. So it, it depends too. Yeah, and I think my final answer to the question is it's the decision to either buy a new car or to acquire a new car in general, whether it's be a lease or a purchase, is not just contingent upon gas savings. There's everything else that goes into. It. Ben, how's it coming with the Lotus? Well, I took a break over the summer because uh, you know, I don't have a garage to work in at the moment. So with that brutal summer sun, I wasn't really doing much. But now I'm getting back on it. Uh, the interior is starting to go back together. I just put the fuel tank back in a few days ago. The dashboard refinishing is almost done. I'm reconditioning all the switches, and those are surprisingly easy to do. I was actually shocked. I was expecting them to be very nasty work. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And I am also, tomorrow, I'm going uh, house shopping, and one of the things I'm looking for in my new place is garage space and workspace. Uh, and I've already got, you know, grand designs on... You know, all of us, all of us around the table are nodding. We're like, yes, yeah. please. Yes, yes. <laughs> my agent is going to be showing me some places tomorrow that have some real potential for, you know, car guy space, you know, and without, you know, driving my significant other up the wall either, so... <laughs> Cool. Well, I can't wait to see it get finished. Me too. You think you're going to finish it this 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 fall? Well, not finish finish. I mean, it's going to be a, a car that has forever you know sure. projects with it. But I hope to get it running by the end of the year. We'll see what happens. But that is something that I would like to possibly talk about in in future episodes. I don't have anything prepared to to mm -hmm. go on with that. Um, I don't know what your intention is. If you're restoring simply to spec, if you have your own personalizations that you want to put into it mm. um, but like me at my my project car is a 97 and where that doesn't really sound all that old um, it really does predate an awful lot of vehicle technology um, yeah. especially just the the thing the little things that seem so simple it's I even noticed yesterday it's missing the arrow that points to the gas door. Now I know where the door oh, yeah. is, <laughs> but it's such a thing nowadays. Hey, look at your your fuel meter to see where your gas tank is. And I realized yesterday it predates the arrow. <laughs> um, so just one of those things. I wanted to start doing projects that's customizing this car. Um, one of which I want to take out the factory stereo that doesn't work anymore, anyways. And I'm looking at building an entertainment unit out of a Raspberry Pi. So oh, wow. potential individual projects that can oh, work yeah. for any car might be something good. If well, you're... funny you should mention the electronics because that's one of the things on my list. This car originally had a radio in it. By the time I bought it, the radio was gone. Mm -hmm. It's got two little speakers on the rear shelf and a crappy antenna out back. That's it. I mean, this is a 1970 model car. So nothing complicated about it. And what I've looked into, of course, speakers, you know, they're great these days. You've, you've really got to try to find a bad speaker these days. Audio geeks will argue that. But, but for, you know, day-to-day -day use, nobody really makes anything rotten. Uh, but what to do for the radio? Because if I buy one of the original 1970 car radios, it's got AM, it's got FM, and it probably sounds pretty lousy. And one of the problems with old ones is that as they age, the solid-state components degrade. Uh, there are ways around that. There are some outfits who for uh, a princely sum will go through and replace all those components for you, but what I've found, there is a unit called the Retrosound. This is a US made product, if I recall correctly, and they have a couple of basic radio models that can then be combined with something like 13 different knob and faceplate kits. And this allows you to replicate the look of just about any era. They've got the ones that have the five buttons in the middle and the two knobs on either end. They've got the stacked knobs on one side, like for you know GM 1980s. They've got lots of different setups and configurations. And this is what I'm probably going to put in this car. They're about 400 bucks. They're all new technology. They've got USB inputs. Uh, they even make a little slimline CD player you can stick under the dashboard to connect to it. They're great and they even, because one of the problems I have with this car is that the heater is fairly close behind the dashboard. The original radio was only about four inches deep and your modern DIN chassis units are generally a little deeper than that. But what the Retrosound will allow you to do is you can detach the faceplate from it and connect it 
to the rest of the radio by a cable that the cable comes in one line. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. If you're if you have the equipment somewhere else and exactly. you just have it look like right. yeah. it's the there. The, the, radio someplace else. the interface cable is nine feet long, so you can remote mount the radio body almost anywhere in the car. That's that brilliant. Think. Yeah. It is really cool. And yeah. it, you know it's got the two knobs, but they're just connected by cables as well. Mm -hmm. And they connect to the interface cable. Uh, where the knobs mount in the chassis, you can move them around to fit different face plates. Uh, it's yeah, it's a, <laughs> making gestures here that nobody but us can see. It's a uh, it's a really brilliant setup. Right. And you you brought up something that that had been uh, on my mind previously, and a really good point um, for some of us when we want to change up our radio. Uh, let's say when the MP3 players came about mm -hmm. and our car predates that we don't even have that plug. Now there are companies where you can actually go out and buy that plug yes. and have some plug just hanging around somewhere. Um, but you don't want to walk into say Best Buy or where have you no. and buy one of their pre-made units. It's flashing blue oh, and red LED and graphics of cars spinning around like it's a video game. <laughs> you can't find something that's just black that illuminates when you turn on the headlight so right. you can see what button you're pushing. You really can't find those too well. Well, the, and I think this is the result of the fact that the factory units in cars have become so good. That's true. Uh, mm -hmm. That there's not that much aftermarket anymore, and what there is, I think, is mostly people with old heaps they want to put something in. So well, I think people who are doing serious customizations on cars. Yeah, and like a lot, what aftermarket radios you can get now, as Becca was saying, a lot of them look like they were designed by seventeen-year-old video game junkies. Yes. Right. I, uh, I mean, I'm looking on good old Crutchfield. Crutchfield, if you want to throw us a dime, that'd be. I love Crutchfield. I love Crutchfield. Do you? I, I yeah. get a lot of mail from Crutchfield. Yeah. Back, you haven't bought anything from us. I put, exactly. lots I put radios there. in several people's cars, and I, I tell them all, do your shopping at Crutchfield. <laughs> the the you know, install kits they have are fabulous. Right. You can, Crutchfield, we are interested in sponsorships. Please give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> you can even buy people gift certificates to have the work done from them. Yeah. If you yeah. buy somebody a component or something and you can't get to them, yeah. you can buy the service. Sorry, but, I'm, I'm really plugging no, that yeah. here, but you but, can buy a gift card for the service to have it installed. But they do have some options available that aren't overstated, that aren't all flashy and glitz. Been but fabulous. But, but Nothing's made me go, ah, that yeah. I gotta have it. Now, if they could make one that looks like a 1980s blob pumped. You know, oh there you yes. go. There you go. You know what? That's we'll work funny. on that. That yes. can be a project. We'll find one that we can just shell out and see what we can do to it. So this may be a topic we get to revisit. <laughs> a friend, a girl, an ex-girlfriend of mine gave me one of the original pull-out radios. Oh wow! It came out of I think a Ford or a Chevy pickup truck. Might have been 40s or 50s era. And you actually, it's one of those things that you pull it out after you've parked, right? So you have the radio in your car and it's playing. The anti-theft. Right. Yes. And no, but, but you were designed to like take it on your picnic. So it still was your transistor radio that sat on the table while you were having your picnic. And when you were done, you put it back in your car and you drove home. Wow. And, and so I have this thing, it doesn't work. It's in, it looks like it's in good physical condition, but I haven't poked and prodded around to see about how to fix it. I'm tempted to take, some, take that thing to somebody and have them tech it up, right? Like leave it pristine on the outside, but let the inside be a simple AM FM transistor radio with an MP3 input. That would be cool. That would be very cool. Yeah, mm. Becca's, yes, yeah. Oh, I just know I have so many things going through my head and that's why <laughs> I, I had thought about that. Um, Raspberry Pi, Arduino. Um, yeah. Visit Adafruit.com. I'm telling you, there are so many ideas popping through my head right now just from adafruit.com. Is that like add, like not subtract, but add? Um, like add a fruit, but there's nothing else to it. They're going to have all kinds of stuff that they come up with for the Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, things like that. Um, breakout boards, huh. uh, uh, B boards, all kinds of stuff, all the way down to your LEDs and resistors they have available. Um, That's have, a huge learning curve for me, though. <laughs> there are lots of videos, yeah. lots of books, lots of inspiration. Just think how what one of those would do for the flux capacitor in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. Go there, scroll down, and I know nobody can see this, and yeah. I hope it's still there. Scroll down. Yeah, I'm scrolling down. Oh, it's not still on the front page. In the project section, Okay. Um, somebody had made a an LED board 
that uh, shows, I don't remember what they were originally going for, but somebody said, hey, that just that looks just like the board out of the DeLorean in Back to the Future. Oh, yeah. So you know what? There's a kit now. You can buy the whole circuit panel and recreate it. Huh. And now, some of them are actually defaulted to the dates that he traveled to and from. But you can <laughs> buy your own circuit board or the kit on this website. Well, if we ever acquire awesome. a DeLorean, we have to do this. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> but first, we need some sponsorships first. So so if there's anyone out there who's interested in being our sponsor, please give us a buzz. We uh, we have some studio improvements to do, and among those studio improvements might be, in fact, let's just get a DeLorean and record in it. Um, that would be awesome. <laughs> there are enough seats for all of us. There though. are two seats, yeah. We could get a couple of DeLoreans. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I like it. Misty was laughing. I have my own seat. So. Right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, I think that's about enough for today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Misty is our sound engineer. There's Ben. Hi there. And there's Becca. And then there's me, Mickey. We uh, are joining you this time from the Strong Box West facility on West Marietta Street in Atlanta. Visit them on strongboxwest.com, and we will look forward to joining you on our next podcast soon. Thank you for listening. This has been The Thing About Cars. We'll see you on the road.